What up? What up? What up? What up? Um, not a case of the day, right? It's a post of the day. Uh, that was a lot of chest extras that I put up there. Um, how are you trying to miss the last two live streams? Come on, man. Um, a lot of a lot of chest extras that I put up that were extremely complicated. But this is 100% what a normal chest moonlighting day, morning. I spent a couple hours moonlighting, just reading chest radiographs. Most of them are in the ICU. Most of them, I mean, this is a good representation of what a normal morning looks like. Um, ICU films suck. They're not fun. Uh, there's a lot going on. Patients are super sick. So this was straight up as I posted, as I wrote my description. One morning I was sitting there just reading out a bunch of chest radiographs. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to cut and paste like 10 of these. And I just ran them once, picked them out for you guys, posted it, and there we are. Uh, I'll try to get to a lot of them. There's, I don't think I can get to all of them. Um, there's just so much going on, so much to explain. So I'll try to get to the ones that you guys are probably the most like wowed by. Um, so let's start it off. This is the one right in the beginning. Uh, posted this one. So right off the bat, what is the most prominent thing about this chest radiograph? Anybody want to shout it out? Give you all a couple of seconds. All right, do you guys see, I have a feeling right when I'm gonna say it, somebody's gonna type it in and press enter. Ah, see, I knew it. Scoliosis, right? Scoli, there you go. So you see the prominent scoliosis, right? Everybody sees that. That's the number one finding. Uh, Anybody can see it, very, very prominent. So that messes up a lot of stuff internally, right? So the body is now naturally contorted into a very unique position. So now as a radiologist, you need to figure out where is the where are the normal structures abnormally placed now, all right? So you have a couple of context clues to help you figure that out. So. As a general rule of thumb, if you haven't figured out that on my YouTube channel, there's that chest, like normal chest, how to read a normal chest radiograph and all that stuff, right? Go go check that out. It's my search pattern of what I'm doing when I'm looking for stuff. What I didn't go too in depth into are the lines and tubes in a chest x-ray. That's the number one thing that I dictate first. You know, I say whatever, indication, whatever, shortness of breath, uh, comparison, whatever it is. And then I say findings, next line, and I say, okay, let me figure out what the lines and tubes are now on this chest radiograph, because I promise you, lines and tubes will tell you a lot about what's going on with that patient. You don't need to know the history of the patient, because you already know it just by looking at the chest radiograph, all right? So let's start off with lines and tubes. The first things first is this dude's intubated. So I don't know if you saw that, but this is the ET tube and it's kind of high. It's pretty high up there. Uh, you kind of see where the carina is. You kind of don't. Uh, it's tough to see on this image, but you want, you want it about four, I don't know, five CM above the carina. Remember the carina is the bifurcation of the main stem bronchi. okay? So this ET tube is kind of high. This is like the thoracic inlet right here, but it's there, all right? So the dude's tubed. All right, next line and tube that you want to think about. Anybody know what this is right here? This line. Man, I probably have so many fingerprints on my TV here. <laughs> Who cares, right? Anybody know what this line is right here? So this is a little catheter, and yes, it always has this break in the catheter right here all right yeah so this is an ng tube if you're not too sure about it you can call it an enteric tube because it's an enteric meaning in the bowel but yeah this is an ng tube all right and again it always has this side port right here you do not really want this side port to be into the esophagus all right so you want to kind of go further down into the stomach but anyway, you know this is the NG tube, but hey, look, that's a big old context clue, right? Because you're saying, all right, well, this is going down into the stomach. So the stomach may be situated-ish, normally-ish, all right? It may be over in that area. So I'm kind of okay with that. Then you look at this line right here. What is this line? So this is the one that I want you to kind of focus on because this is kind of hinting to you. Usually when you place a central line, you're looking at one side of the spine or the other, but this spine is so jacked up, right? that this line right here, the central line is actually kind of hinting to you where the SVC or where the 
SVC RA junction is. So the, you, the, this is what telling you that the heart is actually all over here. So this is all heart right and because of the heart is shoved that way because the heart is in a weird location all the way over there well that portion of the lung is probably really atelectatic meaning it's really scrunched down it's collapsed all right so you, now you're thinking all right well you know what this whole white out of the lung over here or these this hemithoracic white out is largely due to the heart being pushed over all right, and there's a lot of atelectasis. And then you can ask me, well, is there a pleural effusion in there? Yeah, yeah, there might be. Can I tell for sure? Mm, not really. There may be a little bit. I know it's not a big old pleural effusion like you've, we've talked about before when I talked about the lung whiteout of complete lung collapse versus complete, uh, basically fill up a fluid in there, right? It's not one of those instances. But Yes, there may be an effusion hiding down in there somewhere. Mainly though, it's a heart with a lot of atelectatic lung on the scoliotic patient. There may be some pneumonia down here. Can I tell 100% for sure? No, I cannot. This is maybe a patient who's prone to aspiration. So there may be a little like Ditzel's aspiration down here as well. This is a hard patient. Yeah, and that's why sometimes we have to diff it out or, you know, give a differential. Yes, there may be aspiration. Yes, there may be pneumonia. And yes, there may be atelectasis. And likely there's a combination of all three in this area, all right? Kind of the same thing over here. So again, this scoliotic um, spine right here, it's, it's pretty annoying. Some of you guys may ask about this bowel. Is this normal? You may be concerned about a bowel obstruction. You know what? Honestly, we see this kind of bowel all the time, especially in ICU patients. Their peristalsis doesn't work that well. It's, you know, their uh, gut is not moving as it should be. So a lot of them have an ileus sitting in the ICU. I see a lot of small bowel loops. I see large bowel loops. We don't need to go into it again because you guys are experts now. The difference between large and small bowel, right? You guys can ref uh, review that. But yes, um, the next case that I want to go into, let me see. I have it on this side is this guy right here. All right. So this one is interesting because this one is all about lines and tubes, lines and tubes. So you have to figure out, first things first, what is, man, I can't even see it on my screen. What is this line right here? What is that? Anybody? Anybody, anybody, anybody? So just describe it. Where's the axis? Is it coming from below or is it coming from above? Yeah, somebody just mentioned swans. So anybody who's not familiar with that is, it's a swan scan catheter, all right? The cardiologists use this, intensivists use this, and basically it's going from the IJ, going into the heart, going out the main pulmonary artery, and look, it's curving down into the pulmonary artery right here. So that's a swan gans. This actually has another catheter right here. So there's two lines going into that IJ. So yes, two lines can go into the same IJ. Yes, you can do that. Yes, be careful when you're doing it. I place I place two large bore dialysis catheters into the same IJ. You can do it. You just got to be careful with it, all right? For anybody who's wondering, a Swan-Gans catheter can go through a sheath, all right? You place the sheath, a cordis sheath. That's the main one they like using on the floors. You can place a cordis sheath into the IJ. And that anybody who's not familiar with what a sheath is, and I've described it before too, basically a sheath is a doorway from the outside world into the vessel and it has a door into it, all right? So you can leave that sheath into that vessel and you can let it go and then you can kind of walk away. But guess what you can also do? You can put another catheter through that sheath anytime you want and then it can go to wherever you need to be. Then you can pull the catheter out and you still have that doorway open into the vessel. So you don't need to keep re-accessing that same vessel over and over again, all right? Uh, next things, next here, what are these guys right here? Do you see this right here? And do you see this right here? Get used to what this looks like. This is what a surgical chest tube looks like on x-ray, all right? I think this one's better delineated. This is what a surgical chest tube looks like. Yes, it has these dashes, these radiopaque dashes, it has those. So that's surgical chest tubes. This is another one. So he has bilateral chest tubes, all right? So this patient has bilateral chest tubes, all right? He's got a Swan-Gans catheter. Can you see the sternotomy wires on this? You can't really. 
Yeah, you can't really. So now when you're thinking, you're thinking somebody has bilateral chest tubes. Does he, he has a mediastinal drain. Yes, he does. You can barely catch it on the bottom of the screen here, right here. All right. And he's got, he's got uh, swan gans. He's got another central line. So a lot of thoracic surgery just happened. Cardiothoracic, whatever it may be. So the two things that you need to start thinking about and the main one that you need to start thinking about, hey, maybe this is a lung transplant patient. Maybe they took out his two lungs, tossed them into the trash and put two new lungs in there. And then they put two chest tubes in there. They put a mediastinal drain. They closed them up. Go look this up. Anybody who wants to Google it right now, a clamshell sternotomy. That's the one we usually see. Uh, that's what our, what our surgeons use. If some other surgeons out there use a different type of sternotomy for bilateral lung transplants, please let me know. But go look that up, clamshell sternotomy. So if you're putting all these pieces together, you're like, oh, this is a post-op patient, probably got new lungs. Uh, you can also start thinking about, hey, maybe he had some sort of big cardiac surgery. Maybe he had a bypass. You usually don't see bilateral opacity symmetric like that for a cardiac surgery. Usually, again, there's always, you know, exceptions to the rule. Usually when somebody just had a cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. So somebody who just had a cabbage usually has left lower lobe atelectasis and pleural effusion. All right. That's usually what happens when you have symmetric stuff like this. Start thinking about maybe some lung stuff going on. All those opacities throughout the lung, all these guys right here. This is a lot of atelectasis. All right. We can go over another time of how to diagnose interstitial edema or pulmonary edema and x-ray. Uh, that's a whole different discussion. Um, but this is a lot of atelectasis. Is there a little bit of fusion? I mean, uh, interstitial edema, uh, maybe you would have to kind of wishy-washy it, but it's all a lot of atelectasis, all right? What's the next case that I want to go over? This is a great one. Yes, all right, this is a great case, all right? A lot of you guys looked at this case, and I want, I don't want you guys to be looking at chest x-rays anymore like anybody who's never listened to me and been like, you know, for anybody who doesn't know my way of thinking when I look at chest x-rays, they just go straight up, oh, you know, it's a lung whiteout, it's a big old effusion next, right? No, systematically, whatever I've been teaching you guys, systematically, I want you to go over this kind of stuff. So I want you to look at this chest x-ray and let's go over the differential of complete whiteout. Why is it completely whited out, all right? So you gotta start thinking. And this actually has an even bigger hint, a bigger, bigger hint as to why this is all completely whited out. Do you see this right here? What is this guy right here? Can you, can you see that it's going down into the main stem bronchus right there? Do you see how it's selectively gone down into the main stem bronchus? All right, so they actually selectively intubated that main stem bronchus and the whole other lung is completely collapsed all right and this is a whole nother discussion uh, that's a whole nother discussion on its own this is a whole nother discussion maybe two of them this anybody know what this big catheter is right here anybody give you a couple of seconds somebody shout it out all right three two one i'm impatient that is an ECMO catheter, E-C-M-O, ECMO. Intensivists love this, surgeons love this. Go look it up, it's a whole nother discussion. We could talk about it at some point. But it's basically, you're doing this blood circulation for the patient on their own. It's an ECMO catheter, all right? So that's, we'll talk about that at some point. But if you ever see a big old catheter going from up here from the neck, going all the way below the confines of the examination down here, Think about an ECMO catheter, all right? And if it's on the venous side, beautiful, all right? Remember, the ET tube should end above the carina somewhere, but look, they even put another little piece right here and they selectively intubated that main stem bronchus so the whole other lung is completely collapsed down, all right? What's the next one that we can talk about? Let's go over like a little easier one, right? This, this kind of crazy. Um, this one. All right. What is going on here? Uh, what do you think about that lung? That hemithorax? I don't know. It's probably pretty good, right? I don't see much going on. Maybe some hyperinflation. What can hyperinflation signify? I don't know. Maybe this patient's an asthmatic. Maybe the patient's a smoker. Something's going on, right? There's some sort of obstruction chronically. So that could be. Or you're just taking really good breaths. I don't know. All right, 
What is this? What's going on here? Anybody, anybody? Can you, can you appreciate that there are no lung markings in this little area at all, right? You see the lung markings over here. You don't really see any lung markings over here. You see this thick, thick, thick wall thing going on over here. All right, so a couple of things, a couple of things that you can start thinking about. One, there's a lot of schmutz around that circle-y thing, right? There's a lot of junk. Something is there. I think this patient is chronically infected. He's got something that's just going over, like, you know, simmering in that area for a long time, okay? What can happen if somebody is chronically infected? It can develop a, a pulmonary abscess. It can develop, and these are all differentials. These are just what I'm thinking when I'm dictating these. Could be a pulmonary abscess. Mm, it could be an empyema. Okay, that's good too. Uh, how do you differentiate pulmonary abscess versus empyema? Well, what is the difference? A pulmonary abscess is an abscess inside the lung. An empyema is an abscess that's basically outside of the lung, but between the lung and the thoracic cavity. All right, so that space, that potential space, that's where the empyema is, all right? Not actually in the lung. IR question, all right, for anybody who loves IR, should I place a drain in the pulmonary abscess or in the empyema? We don't like to put drains in pulmonary abscesses. We do love to put drains in empyemas. Why do we not like to put drains in a pulmonary abscess? Because it has a potential of causing a bronchopleural fistula. All right, it can fistulize. What is a fistula? It, well, basically, you have a connection between the bronchus and then the pleural space. So what's going to happen? That air from the bronchus is going to continuously go into the pleural space, and that pneumothorax will not resolve. All right, because there's constantly air going into there. That's a bad thing, right? So let's talk about this thing again. That was a little side note, right? So I think there's something going on. Oh, in the third differential, right? I mentioned the two, two main ones that I'm thinking about. The third differential. Has anybody heard of a trapped lung? Anybody, anybody, anybody. Trapped lung. I'll say it again. Anybody heard of that? What does that mean? You will freak out if you're an intern, if you're, I mean, I've seen attendings freak out. You do a, okay, I'm gonna, uh, here's a scenario for you. If, you. if you don't remember this terminology, go back to one of my YouTube videos, we talked about this. A hepatic hydrothorax, all right? This is somebody who has cirrhosis, who usually gets ascites, is abnormal fluid in the cavity and the abdominal cavity, but a hepatic hydrothorax, instead of the fluid accumulating in the abdominal cavity, it actually goes up through pores in the hemidiaphragm and they get massive pleural effusions. So instead of doing paracentesis on these patients, you actually end up doing a lot of thoracentesis on these patients, all right? Somebody who has a chronic, chronic pleural effusion, that lung will smush down and it will, it will just be smushed for who knows how long, years, right? Especially if that ever gets infected, that bacteria will cause that lung to fibrose and it will just collapse down and it will be trapped, all right? So then you're like, hey, I'm this cool intern, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna do this thoracentesis on this patient. You put the needle in, you take the fluid out, you do the post-op chest x-ray or the post-procedural chest x-ray, and you're like, oh shoot, I have a huge pneumothorax, but you're like, man, I swear my needle never touched the, the lung, what's going on here? That's because the lung is trapped. Yes, you took out the fluid. Yes, your needle never touched the lung. But guess what? That lung is actually not really pliable anymore. It's not compliant. Because it's all fibrous down, it's not gonna really do anything. It's not gonna re-expand. It may never re-expand. It may take years to re-expand. That's what a trapped lung is, all right? So this guy actually had an infection. Uh, he was, he was um, not Muslim, by the way. I'm Sikh, for anybody who didn't realize that. Um, so this guy didn't have an infection, or he had an infection for a, a long time. Uh, he ended up having uh, basically an empyema got drained, and that's how he got this stuff going on. All right, next, uh, this, this one right here. Anybody see, anybody see what's going on in this x-ray? Uh, it's hard to see on the screen, but do you see how there's 
increased lucency over here. Do you see how there's increased lucency over here in the soft tissues? Do you even see how, look, you can actually see the muscle striations, the pectoralis muscle striations. Do you see this? You can see how the attachment of the pectoralis muscle right here and then the striations are going. That's the pec major and then the pec minors and there's somewhere too. Yeah, that's subcutaneous emphysema, all right? That's sub-Q emphysema. So that's what you actually want to be looking for when you see sub-Q gas. There's different reasons for it. There's different causes for it. It can happen with trauma. It can happen with a lot of things, but that's what sub-Q gas looks, uh, looks like. And then you want to start looking at the mediastinum and then you want to look for those lucent areas in the mediastinum as well. And then if you do have lucent areas in the mediastinum that shouldn't be there, then you need to start thinking about pneumomediastinum. Then if you see this lucent area, this guy doesn't have it, but if you ever saw a lucent area outlining the heart itself, then you want to be concerned about a pneumopericardium. All right, going back to some other live that we did before, remember, 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 what is a continuous diaphragm sign? Because remember, your diaphragms, your hemidiaphragm should stop right here. Your other hemidiaphragm should stop right here. You should never see it cross over like that. If you do see it cross over like that, you need to be concerned that there's some sort of abnormal gas somewhere where there should not be, all right? You need to be concerned about pneumoperitoneum, you need to be concerned about pneumomediastinum, pneumo something, any sort of abnormal gas will give you a continuous diaphragm sign, all right? Whew, man, that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, I, I told you, I can't go over them all, but those are the main ones that I wanted to go over with you guys. I thought those were pretty crucial. Uh, what are the questions you guys got for me? Lines and tubes, lines and tubes. Always, always, always remember what lines and tubes are in the patient. I promise you, it will tell you a full story about what's going on. Chest x-rays rock. Yeah, they do. They do, and they never stop either. They never stop. Ever, ever, ever. All right, guys. It was good. Um, it turned into a case of the day. I just wanted to post that and just, you know, have you guys take a look at it. ILD fibrosis. Yeah, we can go over that. That's a, that's a tough ball game, man. That's, but we can't do that. Uh, I don't have a good example of trapped lung. That wasn't exactly a trapped lung. I don't want to call it that. Uh, there's no example of trapped lung that I showed. But imagine you did a thoracentesis. The lung was completely whited out. You did the thoracentesis. Now all of a sudden you just have this huge loosened area and you think there's a huge pneumothorax, but it's actually not a pneumothorax. Technically, yeah, there's air in the pleural space, but it's not because you caused it. It's because the lung did not re-expand like it should have once you did the uh, thoracentesis. Remember, hepatic hydrothorax. Remember that. Please, please, please. All right, that'll blow your mind. Intern year residents, it will blow their mind if you go and go tell them about this entity. I'm telling you. I promise you. You will be like, oh, it's just hepatic hydrothorax. That's why we keep doing a thoracentesis on them. They'll be chasing their tails going, oh, why does he keep getting a uh, keep getting pleural fusions? I promise you. You'll be a rock star. All right. You guys good? Should we pick it up again some other time? Yes. Going once. Going twice. The fingers are coming up. Going three times. All right, guys. I appreciate you guys. Uh, until next time. Later.